And we're going to take you through the Temple of Karnak and have a look at some more details of this vast complex. And then we'll take you into the modern market of Luxor. The temples where we are now, known as Karnak, were built over a period of 2,000 years. In about 200 acres of land, we have many temples and many pylon. And in between the towers of the pylon, we usually have the entrance as we have it, and we came through just a minute ago. This was built by some kings, belonged to what we call the Nubian dynasty, and that was around 700 BC. And we were lucky to discover this unfinished because finding this building unfinished gave us some idea about the system they used to lift the blocks to the higher levels. They just start in any great building the first course. And to lift the blocks to the level of the second course and the third course up to the top, they used to make ramps. So what we have, these mounds of clay and mud bricks, are the remains of the ramps used for the building of this unfinished pylon. The god worshipped here, as I mentioned before, is Amun-Ra, and they imagined him in the form of the man with a curved beard, and he had a symbol. That symbol was the ram. That's why we bust by the ram avenue. Entering the temples, we came through the ram avenue, but these rams have the body of the lion. They want to say, our God is very strong, very powerful, like a lion. And in the same time, he is the God Amun-Ra, where the ram had. Okay? God Amun-Ra, like any other God in Egypt, was associated with two other gods, a goddess and a god. The wife, known as Mut, goddess Mut, and the son was known as Khonsu. That's why we have here one, two, three shrines. Each one of them was dedicated to one of the triad worship here. Let's go inside to see what we have inside. Uh, these shrines where we are now, we are in the central one, were built by a king known as Seti II. And that was about 1000 BC. This is God Khonsu, can you see this? and the moon disk with the crescent down below. Can you see it? Yeah. Now, we have here, this building is the main chapel, or the holy of the holies, in which they used to keep the sacred bark of the god or the sacred statuette of the god himself. Let's go to see it, please. This is the holy of the holies, the chapel. And actually, this chapel was built by Alexander the Great. You know Alexander the Great. He came from Macedonia and conquered Egypt on 331 BC. And he was planning to have his great empire based on Egypt. And actually, he stayed in Egypt for a very short time, a few years. He established his capital, I mean the city of Alexandria on the Mediterranean Sea, and then he decided to build for the Egyptian gods. Building to the Egyptian gods means he is going to have the divine approval. The Egyptian priests of those gods will evolve legends to prove that he has a divine right to be a ruler or a king for this country. And that's why he came to the Karnak. He found the original chapel of the Karnak temple of the god Amun-Ra was completely collapsed. So he reconstructed the chapel right here using the granite blocks scattered here or there or parts of the old obelisks and built this chapel. The sides or the walls of this chapel were decorated with the scenes of Alexander the Great. Can you see this scene of the standing king? This is not an Egyptian pharaoh. He is Alexander the Great, but represented in the form of an Egyptian pharaoh an Egyptian king, offering to the god standing up. Can you see that god standing up? The tall crown is the god Amun-Ra. Actually, both of them were worshipped here, especially Amun-Ra. And Amun-Ra was considered as the king of the Egyptian gods. Looking to the ceiling, 
If you look to the ceiling, the ceiling was decorated with the blue background and the bright stars. The ceiling here in this building is a representation for the sky. The floor is a representation for the earth. Once we have the statue of the God here, it means the God is in his universe. This is the universe of the God. Okay? Can we go this way, please? Right over there, you can see the water. It's what we call the sacred lake. The sacred lake in any of the temples is a representation for the ocean, as I mentioned before. The universe for the ancient Egyptians was an ocean. And the gods go around the universe. They cannot go around the universe without having a boat. And that was maybe the first idea about the solar boats to sail around the universe. And then later, all the gods of Egypt and the kings of Egypt, each one of them should have what we call the solar boat to sail around the universe. And maybe the Egyptians were the first to build the spaceships. <laughs> so the, the ocean or the representation of the ocean and the temple is what we call the sacred lake. The function also is, before the priests start any service in the temple, they should be washed in the lake. And also beside that, they put the small boat of the god, sail around the lake, right there, symbolizing the god is sailing around the universe. Uh, beside that, right over there, you can see some granite scarab. The scarab during the ancient times was considered as a manifestation for that god known as Khebiri. Khebiri or Khepir. He was the god of the rebirth, the one who was going to reborn again. The natives believe that any woman, unmarried woman, if she goes around this scarab for several times, say six or three times, She's going to get married very soon. Yeah. Okay, you can do your best now. <laughs> what about going backwards? Well, it means divorce. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you go by yourself just to take a look and come back to me, please. When you're touring a major complex like the Temple of Karnak, it's nice and important to have some free time so you can walk around at your leisure and have a closer look at things that interest you. It's also nice to have a guided tour, especially when you're in the hands of Sami, our Egyptologist who's been taking us all throughout Egypt. Walking through this great hypostyle hall is one of the thrills of a lifetime, for it is the most important and largest hypostyle hall in Egypt. It covers such a large ground area that Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris could fit inside of it one of the great obelisks built for Queen Hatshepsut. It's quite fascinating to read the history of the hieroglyphics and how it documents the different kings who came into Karnak, one succeeding the other, trying to outdo his predecessor and building greater columns, higher temples, bigger monumental statues. And each king would generally erase the name of the preceding king and put his own name in place. And then his name gets erased by the next pharaoh who comes along. And so it goes throughout the entire history of ancient Egypt.